Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this A-level religious ethics revision video. I'm Ben Wardle and we are continuing our look at natural moral law with a look at proportionalism. And we'll be asking what is proportionalism? Why might somebody appreciate this development on natural moral law? And why has there been criticism of it, particularly from the Catholic Church? So we'll be looking at what proportionalism is, and then we'll be looking at the strengths and the weaknesses. And I thought we could start with this quote from Vardy and Groach, which I think really encapsulates for us the whole point of, I can't even speak, <laughs> to excuse me, I'll try that again, proportionalism, there we go. So it really encapsulates the idea and it gives us a really strong foundation for understanding it in this video. So proportionalism holds that there are certain moral rules and that it can never be right to go against these rules unless, and that is a very important word, unless there is a proportionate reason which would justify it. The proportionate reason is based on the context or situation, but this situation must be sufficiently unusual and of sufficient magnitude to provide a reason which would overturn what would otherwise be a firm rule. On this basis, they say, moral laws derived from natural law or similar approaches can provide firm moral guidelines which should never be ignored unless, again, there's that really significant word, it is absolutely clear that in the particular situation, this is justified by a proportionate reason. So as we know with natural moral law, it is about establishing these absolute universal precepts, those five primary precepts which must always be followed. But as we also know with natural moral law, there is this emphasis on the individual using their reason. And we see from Aquinas, for example, he says you should only follow the secular laws you're only bound to follow them if you can see there is a just reason why that there is a very clear to you reason that that secular law is in accordance with the divine law with the eternal law ultimately and so there is this opportunity within natural moral law for the individual to have autonomy and this is what proportionalism is all about it's about saying absolutely we have these fixed unchangeable precepts we have these fixed absolute certain moral rules and of course Cicero said that's what natural moral law is meant to be all about it's about saying there is one law eternal that is unchangeable and that is binding upon all people at all times in all places so we do have those absolute moral truths and of course for Aquinas you know morality is derived from the eternal law from the mind of God and so it is fixed it is absolute however and this is really important, there are certain exceptional circumstances, there are certain cases which have sufficient unusuality and have sufficient magnitude that actually you might overturn what would otherwise be a firm rule. So 99% of the time, you will be following those natural moral law primary precepts. However, there might be that 1% instance when using your reason leads you to conclude it is absolutely clear that not following that precept is actually the best way to pursue goodness. And remember, for natural moral law scholars, we have that synderesis principle that your innate impulse is to do good and avoid evil. And so there may be extraordinarily exceptional circumstances when to pursue good means not following the primary precept of natural moral law. But they are exceptional. They have to have sufficient magnitude in order to provide that reason which would overturn what would otherwise be a firm rule. So let's just unpack this a little bit more. I want to share with you this quote from Hoos that I think really encapsulates proportionalism. And he said, it is never right to go against a principle unless there is a proportionate reason which would justify it. And remember, you are using your reason, your God-given reason to work out that reason. And that is the whole purpose of natural moral law, that the individual is empowered to use their own reason. And so for um, 
it, for a bit of context, proportionalism originated among Catholic scholars in Europe and America in the 1960s. So, it's, you know, it's a recent development. It arose from increasing concern that the Catholic tradition was too deontologically rigid. And remember, that is a criticism of natural moral law, that it's too rigid, that it's too inflexible in order to be applicable, that it can't be applied in modern life because life is complex and these principles, these precepts are so inflexible that they're just not practical, they're just not workable. So as I say, it was formalized in the 1960s. However, supporters of this theory say that it is to some extent visible in the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas himself. So they do trace its roots back to St. Thomas Aquinas. However, really importantly, it is condemned and rejected by the Catholic Church. In Veritas Splendor, Pope John Paul II condemned it explicitly on the grounds that it denies any action can in and of itself be intrinsically evil. And that is something the Catholic Church likes to do. For example, they say contraception is intrinsically evil. And all that means is that there is never an excuse to use it. There is never a proportionate reason that something the church says is wrong might actually be right. Um, things like euthanasia, for example, as well. So the Catholic Church is very much against proportionalism because they believe that you are trying to move the goalposts and you shouldn't be doing that because you are essentially then going against God, thinking that you are God. You know, you must always follow those absolute principles and teachings. There is no room for manoeuvre, so to speak. So we can see this as a method for resolving conflicts of values. So, for example, when you have two primary precepts that contradict one another, for example, what do you do then? Proportionalism says we have the answer. You use your reason, yeah, and you have to work it out. It allows us to determine objectively what is morally right or wrong about an action. And it then allows us to ground concrete behavioral norms and exceptions to them. So it's about recognizing that we do need fixed and firm rules, which is what natural moral law provides us with. Remember, it's about discovering these eternal, universally binding truths. Um, but it's about acknowledging that there are going to be exceptions. There are going to be those 1% cases when an exception is needed. Um, and so just to give you, again, more context, proportionalism is rooted in the work of Aquinas, that where a proportionate reason exists, it would be right to ignore a rule in that situation. For example, Aquinas held that it would be lawful for a starving man to save his life by stealing the property of others. However, the Catholic Church, as I say, does condemn proportionalism. Agents become morally good or bad only when you consider both the proportion of value to disvalue in the act and the intention of the agent. So remember, when we spoke about the doctrine of double effect, we spoke about the difference between intention and foresight. We said that your intention matters when it comes to morality. But another thing that we need to talk about is the idea of values and disvalues. And this is basically when you make a moral decision about weighing up the value that making that decision will add and also the disvalue it will create. So it's basically seeing it as a set of scales and asking, will the value outweigh the disvalue? So, for example, if a surgeon cut human flesh, you don't immediately think that cut is good or that cut is bad. It depends on the surgeon's intention and the value or disvalue that the patient gets out of it. So there cannot be any acts that are intrinsically evil. Everything needs to be weighed up and assessed. Now, this might start sounding a little bit like situation ethics. And of course, as we know, the Catholic Church is very critical of these theories that seem too flexible because the, the church would say they become a slippery slope and they mean you can ultimately get away with doing anything. Um, and, you know, you start to undermine morality and moral truth. And um, so, for example, the physical act of abortion, according to proportionalism, is not necessarily intrinsically evil. You don't see anything as intrinsically evil. We can only judge morality by looking at the value, disvalue, of the abortion and at the agent's intention in wanting to bring about an abortion in that situation. So, for example, the mother's life is at risk. You know, they have uterine cancer, for example, you know, and removing the cancerous uterus means bringing the, the child's life to um, an end, that the fetus will not be able to um, survive. You could say, you know, well, is the child going to be born with severe um, 
illness, you know, with a really, really painful, debilitating illness, which they are not going to survive for long anyway, you know, so what is the value and disvalue balance for thinking about those scales? And also, what is the agent's actual intention, you know, and of course, as we said about the doctrine of double effect, it's very hard to actually prove your intention. Could we end up being able to literally get away with murder by saying, well, it wasn't my intention to kill them. I had good intentions. Um, and so we can say that the physical act of abortion or indeed any physical act is pre-moral. Morality should be calculated by the value, disvalue balance and the agent's intention. And that is very important because with proportionalism, we are talking about this idea that nothing is intrinsically evil, which is the key Catholic thing to do. They love to use that label in the church that things are intrinsically evil. And we're saying that everything is pretty much like situation ethics, I'll say that again, to be calculated in that particular circumstance. And it's saying that there are cases, there are situations when actually breaking the rule or ignoring the rule may be the good thing to do, prioritizing that cinderesis principle. So Richard McCormick said, every moral choice occurs in a context where competing values and disvalues must be weighed critically. So all he's saying is, you know, you can't go around saying certain things are always wrong because, you know, everything is complex in life. Everything depends on the particulars of the situation, the particulars of that specific context. You must always be weighing things up rather than saying that's always wrong, irrespective of the context, irrespective of the circumstances. And then James Walters says proportionalism is a method for resolving conflicts of values and for determining objectively what is morally right or wrong about an action, as distinguished from judging the goodness or badness of the agent, and then C, grounding concrete behavioural norms and exceptions to them. So it's all about resolving conflicts of values, and it is about weighing things up, looking at your scenario, looking at your situation and saying, OK, let's, let's consider, excuse me, the value disvalue balance and let's consider the agent's intentions. And it is only then that we can assess morality. Now, as I say, the Catholic Church is opposed to this approach. There is never a proportionate reason to break a precept. You can never say, well, in this case, because it's such an exceptional case, I'm going to break the rule because the church argues that morality is very objective. You know, they see it very much as coming from the textbook. There is no flexibility involved. Some things, for example, are always intrinsically evil. Intrinsic means within. So it means the act itself is intrinsically evil. So whereas the proportionalist says things are pre-moral and you only assess morality when you've considered that value, disvalue, balance and intention, the church says that certain things are always wrong. And therefore, Pope John Paul II wrote, one must therefore reject the thesis characteristic of teleological and proportionalist theories, which holds that it is impossible to qualify as morally evil according to its species, its object, the deliberate choice of certain kinds of behavior or specific acts apart from a consideration of the intention for which the choice is made or the totality of the foreseeable consequences of that act for all persons concerned. So as I say, he is writing, he is saying that some things are always intrinsically evil. So teleological proportionalist theories are to be rejected because you, you, you go down a slippery slope. You end up in a position where things are being justified, where exceptions are being made and you lose your moral standards you lose your moral authority remember natural moral law in that original form is based for Aquinas on an eternal law that is unchanging it's in the mind of God it is not about us creating rules it is about us discovering them yeah and so that does to an extent take away our autonomy whereas proportionalism is very much emphasizing the individual's autonomy and for the catholic church that essentially means you think you have more knowledge than god that you think you know better because you then start to make your judgments whereas of course the eternal law is eternal it's absolute it's in the mind of god we are supposed to be discovering it rather than reinventing it, chopping and changing it for ourselves. So 
Let's take a look at your AO2. What are the strengths of proportionalism? Well, we could say it is a common sense and flexible approach because it seems to provide us with a practical approach to ethics. It recognizes that there is complexity in moral decision making, that yes, it's important to have your fixed moral norms, but that sometimes they may have to be broken. And so recognizing that, taking that into account means proportionalism makes natural law applicable to the real world. Yeah, it's not a textbook approach. It's about saying we want a practical approach. Roll up your sleeves. Let's start applying this in real life. So, for example, we could say it seems common sense to lie in order to save a life or to steal to avoid dying of hunger because you're weighing up your values and disvalues and you're thinking about your intention. So there is much more to take into account. You can't be too deontological in your thinking. You need to take in that into account that more global picture, if you like, and really take that step back and assess the whole situation. We'd also say it has a more wide ranging application, so it can even be used outside of natural moral law, including in modern international law. For example, allowing a proportional response to a threat is built into European law. So it's something that can actually inspire ethics on a larger scale that goes beyond the natural moral law theory. So it's a key principle that we should have in our laws. And so many people can actually find this accessible, find this helpful and find this important for their own moral decision making as individuals. Because, again, it's reflecting the fact we do need fixed rules. We do need clear rules. But we then also need to take into account that sometimes they may need to be broken because they may not be helpful or, you know, they, they may not in every single case be allowing us to pursue the good. And um, remembering that synderesis takes priority over the primary precept, that you've got to do good and avoid evil. You've got to use your own reason to work that out. However, we do also have those weaknesses. So as I say, it's been condemned by the Catholic Church, 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. So Pope John Paul's encyclical said that it is an inappropriate approach because it denies that any action can in and of itself be intrinsically evil. And the Catholic Church says certain actions can be. There are certain things that are always wrong. And I do think actually that many people beyond Catholicism agree with that, that there are certain acts that are intrinsically evil. For example, rape yeah the catholic church says things like contraception i don't really think the majority of people would agree with that but actually I do think there are things that people will always agree are wrong such as rape and so you could say proportionalism is inappropriate because actually there are things that are always wrong there are certain things that aren't pre-moral that actually they are intrinsically evil and so you cannot say there may be an exception you cannot say well let's consider their intention because there's no intention or no exception that could justify that action but of course there is going to be debate about what those things are the catholic church has many of them you know other people may only have one or two non-negotiables such as rape, for example. Uh, and we can also say it can be difficult to calculate accurately. You know, we said this, didn't we, about the doctrine of double effect and, you know, the idea that you can never really know someone's intention. You have to take their testimony, as Richard Swinburne would say, to be truthful. And so one of the biggest criticisms of any consequentialist ethic is that it's difficult to accurately predict value and disvalue. And it's, you know, again, then difficult to actually know the agent's intentions. And of course, we can then apply that to other ethical theories and approaches such as utilitarian ethics. It is impossible to predict outcomes with absolute certainty. Whereas if you're saying that an action is intrinsically evil, we all know where we stand. And so you can say that actually this could be a little bit more unreliable. It could be open to exploitation. It could be open to getting things wrong because it's difficult to actually accurately calculate. And so, because this is our last natural moral law video, I wanted to conclude today with a quick true or false about the theory. So, number one, do you think it's true or false? St. Thomas Aquinas was a 13th century philosopher known as the doctor of the church. That is, of course, true. Um, what about the next one? Marriage is one of the five primary precepts of natural moral law. That one is actually false, of course. Secondary precepts are rigid and inflexible. They do not change. That is, again, false. The primary precepts are rigid and inflexible, whereas your secondary precepts are more culturally relative. 
The doctrine of double effect can be used to justify killing as a side effect of self-defense. That is something that St. Thomas Aquinas said. So yes, that's true. And proportionalism today focus is supported by the Catholic Church. No, it is not, because the church says there are some things that are intrinsically evil. And so no weighing up of values and disvalues and no consideration um, of the agent's intention could justify it. It is intrinsically evil. And that is the phrase I want to leave you with today. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.